welcome back everybody. Uh, it is Tuesday here. I know it's Wednesday for at least one of you because uh, we are an international group and that is fantastic and really fun. So let's, uh, let's jump in and get started. So uh, this is our very first field trip. So yay, <laughs> Natalie can hear me now. It's amazing how much better the technology works when I click the button. Yeah, really kind of, I'm a functional adult. Okay, <laughs> this is our very first field trip. It is the fifth Tuesday of the month, which means um, it's a theme that only comes up once in a while. And uh, I'm calling it field trip because that makes me happy and because it's 2020 and we're not going anywhere. So uh, this is my, my chance to, to make a virtual trip, but it's not just me talking about traveling. Uh, which would be incredibly self-indulgent and a lot of fun, but probably really, really boring for the rest of the world. Oh, oh, hey, it's MD. Awesome. Welcome. Um, so <laughs> sorry, podcast friends, like I'm responding to the chat. Uh, you know, that's, uh, you, you guys know the drill you've been around, but yeah, I basically sound like lemur on caffeine. So that's, that's how we do things. So our field trip is not just going to be me sharing um, some travel info, but specifically for creative purposes, I'm going to talk about things that I experienced the way I uh, perceived that environment and that sort of thing uh, to be useful in a uh, writing context, um, because there were things uh, specifically about, you know, some of the places we're going to talk about today that I did not, I would not have imagined it the way I experienced it. So, um, and then we are going to have a story time, which I don't think I've ever done a story time in this particular venue. Some of you have caught them in my other videos uh, for uh, Gen Con or seminars or whatever. Um, but we're going to do a story time here and uh, hopefully that'll be a lot of fun. So field trip, field trip. Yep. Yeah, okay. Awesome. Um, let us, oh, I do want to say um, that uh, last week, uh, last week ended on a little bit of a cliffhanger, uh, not intentionally, it's just that's the information I had. Um, but I want to say that Indomio is probably fine. So uh, if you're if you're new to the party, Indomio is my Doberman. Um, those of you who have been around for a while, yay, Indomio is probably fine. So we had already ruled out cancer. Uh, we got the test back. Blastomycosis is negative. So um, she still has uh, some stuff going on, but her uveitis is uh, reducing, like everything's going in the right direction. So you know what? I would be totally fine with idiopathic uveitis. Like that's a completely fine thing. Oh, hey, speak of the devil. Oh, bye. Okay, she's just not gonna stay and meet her public, so, okay. Okay, so we are looking at uh, in the Endurance Glacier. So we are at Elephant Island and we're looking at the Endurance Glacier. So a couple of things to be aware of. Uh, first of all, this is a place where you can see how much the glacier has receded. You can actually visibly see it. Um, if you see where the water changes color, um, that is glacial debris that has made um, you know, just a, a pile of trash, <laughs> pile, pile of glacial trash uh, in the water. And then as the glacier has receded, it's leaving that debris, that's where you're getting the water change. Um, so you can see how far back, um, and again, that edge that you're seeing the face of the glacier i'm not actually sure how to how tall it is at this point but probably three or four hundred feet so this is a considerable distance that's maybe receded but i want to talk about elephant island and the endurance glacier oh sorry look bonus whale just can't not get whales <laughs> so this is the, all the endurance glacier um i'm going to talk about elephant island because it is one of the most phenomenal adventure stories um and it's all true. So I don't know where the Hollywood summer tentpole blockbuster is, uh, but nobody can nobody can write this better than the way it actually happened. So, so let's talk about this. All right. So Ernest Shackleton has done polar expeditions before. They were adventurous in their own ways. We are not going to talk about them because we don't have time uh but he's definitely definitely already had enough adventure for most people but before he starts the endurance expedition but he's going to do the endurance expedition and their goal was to depart to go down to uh antarctica 
cross the continent of Antarctica, hitting the South Pole on the way, and come out on the other side and head to New Zealand. Um, so quite a feat. That's already a ridiculously ambitious feat. By the way, the year is 1914. Um, we are working our way up to World War II. Actually, things start to go bad and Shackleton uh, cables back to um, the UK is like, hey, you know, <laughs> I've got this ship and, and, and these people and we're ready to go. Or, you know, how, do, you, do you need us back? You know, what's, what do we do about the expedition? And he gets a one word cable back that just says proceed. So he's like, great, we're taking off. We're going to go do this. So, oh, and Elena is telling me that the Endurance Glacier is about 400 feet tall there. So thank you for that. Um, so we're going to... Um, Sorry, pulled my notes back there. So they're heading uh, heading south. They stop at South Georgia Island, um, where there's a Norwegian whaling station, and they uh, talk with those guys for a while and and uh, finish finish provisioning. And they hear that it's a very heavy ice year, so they take on extra stores and some extra clothes. Um, south Georgia Island, by the way, is very far south. It's in the middle of nowhere. You'll see a map later. Um, and it's the only thing that's there is that station for processing whales, as we said. So they stay with them a little bit longer than they had originally intended to take on extra provisions because they heard it was a heavy ice here. Um, and then they go, and it was probably a good thing that they, they did that. Um, so they travel south they, uh, toward the actual continent of Antarctica. They go over a thousand miles. They are approximately one day out from their intended landing point when they get stuck in the ice. And um, so these photos, by the way, are all actual photos from the expedition. Um, and the photographer made some legitimate sacrifices to get these photos out. So let's really appreciate them. So they're one day out, they get stuck in the ice and with the most perfect description. Um, so it was recorded as like an almond in toffee. <laughs> they were not going anywhere. So now the ship is drifting in the ice because <clears throat> when I first think about this, um, the, you know, you think about the ships getting stuck in the ice, you just think of the ship stuck in the ice. Like that's how I, I'd always pictured this when I heard the story. But when I started reading into it, I'm like, no, no, the, the ice, the ice is moving, right? The ice is on the ocean. So it's actually traveling. So the ship is being carried along with the ice. And so they're trying to get out. They're trying to keep, you can see here, they're cutting out around the ship because when the ice comes together, when it, as it freezes over, they want it to lift the ship above the ice rather than crushing the ship. Um, so they're doing constant, what I'm gonna call ice maintenance <laughs> on the ship. But this ice is, you know, you can, you always picture it as, you know, just smooth and, and flat, but look at these photos. It's incredibly jagged and rough. Um, so they're, clearing out the ship. That's in, I believe, February that they get stuck. Um, and in October, their trapped ship springs a leak. So I want you to, like, that's a long time to be stuck on the ice and not going anywhere. And um, there are photos that I didn't include of, you know, the men out on the ice playing football and you know, doing things because um, they've got nowhere to go. They've got nothing to do. They're, they're literally just waiting for the ice to let them out. Um, so they're in the, they're in the ice for, I want to say nine months. Um, finally, the ship springs a leak because the ice is putting so much tor uh, torsion on it. Um, and so they abandon ship, they make a camp on the ice itself and stay near the ship, pulling out supplies and whatnot as they go. And then in November, they watch the ship go down. I believe I have some photos of this. Yes. So there's the camp on the top left. Um, and then <laughs> the ship, a beautiful night uh, photo there. It's all night you know, at this point. The ship's keeling over, and then this ship is finally crushed by the ice. And um, I can't imagine like watching that happen, knowing that you are thousands and thousands and thousands of miles from anything even remotely. I mean, from land, right? You're not. You're not. You, know, you don't even. What's under you is just water. So uh, they, at that point, because the ice again is moving, you're not frozen in the ice in one plot. The spot, the ice is moving. The ice had carried them about 1,200 miles off of their course. So they have 1,200 miles even to get back where they started, much less uh, to any place that's useful. So they have three lifeboats, which they load up with their supplies and begin dragging by hand over the ice. And I've got some photos of this happening here. Um, and 
So, the, uh, and at this point, our, our photographer who is Frank Hurley, Frank Hurley is the photographer. And he, he actually at one point threw food out rather than lose his camera equipment. So that's why we still have our, these photos, which is amazing. Um, so the, um, the ice starts breaking up. They get into the, uh, they get into the, to the boats and they are just, they spend five months dragging these boats across the ice. So nine months of trapped in the ice, five months dragging the boats across the ice. Um, they finally get to Elephant Island, which is where that glacier is that you were looking at just a few minutes ago. Um, they have not touched land in 497 days. Elephant Island is the first time they have touched land. They're really, really happy to be on Elephant Island. Um, and they get some elephant seals and some penguins and, and life is really good, except they're still thousands of miles from absolutely nowhere. It's just that now they have some dirt. Um, so there's no way that they're going to get discovered or found. Um, and you know, but at this point it's 1915. So, um, you know, just calling on the sat phones, not really an option. So the closest thing they can think of is that whaling station at South Georgia. That is 800 miles away. You're in an area of the sea that's going to routinely experience 50 foot waves. That's just normal. You have a 22 foot long boat. You have a sextant. You have a chronometer that may or may not work. And you can't really see the sun reliably in order to navigate. Let's do this. <laughs> so six people, um, Shackleton and six, um, five of the men, um, set out to try to reach South Georgia and that whaling station. Everyone else takes the remaining two boats, flips them over and makes a cabin uh, out of it. And it was just called the Snuggery. And so they're just gonna stay there and hope that Shackleton gets back. Sorry, I'm just catching up on the on the, on the the chat. Okay, we're good. Um, <laughs> I'm dying at disaster selfies. There, there are actually quite a lot of selfies um, and portraits in these, in these photo collection. Um, but you know, really like, you got 14 months on the ice. What are you going to do? Take some selfies by all means. Okay. So they are on this, um, incredible voyage in this tiny little boat. They're trying to make it to Georgia, South Georgia. Um, the spray on the ice as it's splash, I'm sorry, the spray on the boat as it's splashing on the boat. Um, and it's freezing. It actually freezes up to 15 inches thick on the hull of the boat, which is of course handling, affecting the trim and the handling of the boat, which is not really designed to do this kind of thing in the first place. Um, so uh, they've got some rocks that they've put in the boat to use as ballast. And so they're moving the rocks around as the ice freezes harder. It just, um, you know, like it was a heck of a sailing uh, venture anyway. Um, they're beating the ice off the canvas sail so that it doesn't have time to freeze thick. Uh, all kinds of stuff. They're getting frostbite. Of course they're getting frostbite. They're in freezing water constantly. There's no way not to be um, wet. For six days, they don't see the sun at all. And again, that's kind of what they're needing to use to navigate. So um, Frank Worsley, I believe I got this name somewhere. Um, yeah, Frank Worsley is uh, taking uh, sextant readings and doing everything else by dead red dead reckoning. Just you know, he'll see the sun when he can, and then we'll just really try to stay on target until we see the sun again, which would be days, you know, days and days at a time. Um, yeah, oh for Icelandic feldspar at that point. <laughs> if you've uh, um, if when I actually, when I talk about in the Norse mythology talk and I, I have some Icelandic feldspar, I pass around for this. Um, and they did not have that, um, there with them. And, um, it, it's a way to find the sun when you can't actually see the sun and theorize that the uh, Vikings used that for navigation. Um, but yeah, we, not an option there because they're on, you know, our, or, uh, volcanic rock or, uh, I don't, actually don't even remember what, uh, what Elephant Island is, but it doesn't matter. There's not that much <laughs> useful, uh, useful there if you're not an elephant seal. So, um, and then they have a, this one particular adventure, which uh, I'm just going to read Shackleton's words to you because I can't say it any better than this. Um, I called to the other men that the sky was clearing. Yay. And then a moment later, I realized that what I had seen was not a rift in the clouds, but the white crest of an enormous wave. 
During 26 years of experience in the ocean in all its moods, I had not encountered a wave so gigantic. It was a mighty upheaval of the ocean, a thing quite apart from the big white-capped seas that had been our tireless enemies for many days. I shouted, for God's sake, hold on, it's got us. Then came a moment of suspense that seemed drawn out into hours. White surged the foam of the breaking sea around us. We felt our boat lifted and flung like a cork in breaking surf. We were in a seething chaos of tortured water, but somehow the boat lived through it, half full of water, sagging to the dead weight and shuddering under the blow. We bailed with the energy of men fighting for life, flinging the water over the sides with every receptacle that came to our hands. And after 10 minutes of uncertainty, we felt the boat renew her life beneath us. So, spoiler alert, he did write that, so he lived through this. But, um, you know, just when when Shackleton says in 26 years he hadn't seen a wave that big, he's not talking 26 years of, pad of paddling in a pond, right? He's This is already a polar explorer, so it's pretty, pretty dramatic weather. After 14 days, they catch sight. They can see South Georgia Island, which is amazing. Um, <laughs> and... Um, that I'll, I'll show you in a minute wh why that dead reckoning was so impressive. Um, but they, they see South Georgia Island. They can't land because they're coming in. There's rocks between them and the islands. So they're going to have to get around them, which I can't even imagine how frustrating that must be. Um, but they see the island. Okay, we'll, we'll get there in the morning. We'll go around. And in the morning, there's a storm which blows them back out to sea and they lose sight of the island. Um, I'm telling you, I couldn't write this any meaner than what actually happened. Um, two days, two days later, they're finally able to make it back to that island and they come in. They're running out of water, by the way, all of the time that this is happening. So they finally get back in two days later. In their entire 14 days of travel, um, they had only seen the sun on four days. And the rest was Dead Reckoning by Frank Worsley, who is bravo. By the way, he's a Kiwi. Good job, Grace. There we go. You had uh, got some good countrymen there. So they arrive on South Georgia, uh, but they're on the wrong side of South Georgia. The whaling station is on the other side and South Georgia, wouldn't you know it, is made of mountains. So you've got a mountain um, ridge right down the middle of the island. Um, two of the two of the men at this point are too weak. They're, there's no way they're gonna be able to walk. Um, so they leave one person to stay with them and then Shackleton and two other people start over the mountains. Um, they don't have a tent. They don't have sleeping bags. They have very little in the way of gear. Um, they do take a cook stove. Um, so in some uh, uh, the last of their food, they you know they they brought some blubber and things. Um, so they've got um, that. And they, at this point, nobody has ever been there you know nobody's mapped that the whaling station doesn't care what's on the mountains literally it's just a blank space on the map that, you know this is south georgia island here's the whaling station here's some island um nobody had nobody had mapped this much less had a route across these mountains and i want to say these mountains are something like 9,000, 10,000 feet high so these are these are real mountains um so they start and they walk overnight like go this way, nope, backtrack, go this way, nope, backtrack, go that way. And in overnight, uh, they get through the mountains, um, not directly over. They do find find ways through. I don't care. It's still impressive. They're, um, you know, crossing at 4,500, 4, 5,000 feet, something like that. Um, they get to the next, uh, the next morning, they hear the steam whistle from the whaling station. So they know they're on the right track. Um, they're trying to find a way down to the whaling station. The only play, way they can get down, there's a stream that, oh, hi, thank you. Yes, yes, you're, you're interrupting my dramatic moment. Okay, um, there is a stream that uh, runs, runs down and they, it's waist deep melt water. So freezing, <laughs> waist deep melt water, probably only liquid because it's moving and then a 30 foot waterfall. And that's the only way they can find down. So that's what they do because they're done at this point. So they literally um, wade through this stream and then go over the 30 foot waterfall. They do have a rope. They try to uh, lower people down safely on, um, but I think the third guy just kind of goes for it because there's nobody to lower him down. Um, and they make it 22 miles over completely unmapped mountainous terrain overnight to the whaling station. 
Nobody replicated this, by the way, until 1955, when British explorer Duncan Carse retraced the route across the South Georgia successfully. And his comment was, I don't know how they did it, except that they had to. <laughs> like, like, this is crazy. Um, so they get to South Georgia whaling station in true English fashion. Ernest Shackleton's like, hey, I'm sorry, we look like a mess. You know, <laughs> haven't been on land in, you know, a year and a half kind of starving and dying but you know i'm sorry we're not shaved up and stuff um they go around they rescue the three guys on the other side of the island and they're like okay now we need to go get the rest of our crew from uh, uh elephant island so they take a whaler it's now may by the way so they take a whaler so we're getting into um you know autumn there uh, they take a whaler to try to reach elephant island but the winter ice is closing in and they can't make it which how terrifying and frustrating as as your leader uh to to face that so they go back they go to the falkland islands they get a troweler they try to make it they can't make it they go to chile uh, residents of chile actually take up a donation to rent a schooner to go and try to get these men off elephant island they're 100 miles away from elephant island when they lose an engine so they have to go back and try it again. In Chile, again, they get the steam tug Yelcho. Yelcho actually finally makes it. Um, so while the men on Elephant Island, um, Frank Wilde was uh, the leading there while Shackleton was gone. And somebody comes running up and it's like, there's a ship. Should we set a fire to let them know that we're here and help guide them in? Because it's again very heavy ice, very heavy mist, all of these things. I'm sure you're adding a lot of drama here. Thank you. Um, and so they put a, they have one can of fuel left. They put a hole in it, light their clothes on fire, and guide the Yelcho in. Um, so they get there, and um, Frank Wilde's like, hey, thanks for coming back for us. Really appreciate it. Do you want to see how we've survived here? Because we've set up like this the snuggery in the um at made out of the other boats and we've been you know hunting and do you want to see how we've lived and shackleton's like we had to try four times to get here get in the freaking boat let's go <laughs> we don't know when we're going to be able to get out and so within an hour everybody's on the boat and gone um and i do mean everybody uh no not one person was lost on this entire escapade which is phenomenal um they, there was you know there was frostbite there was injury um but you know at least some of the people lost you know toes and, and pieces to to frostbite but everybody made it out alive which is amazing they were on elephant island for 127 days after their 487 days or whatever it was i said that they had been on the water um so just an amazing uh, adventure story. Um, oh, and hold on, let me get photos. Um, on the right, um, of the men waving, that's Shackleton and the other five departing for South Georgia. So that's everybody be like, bye, hope you make it, come back for us when you do, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Um, and then this is the Yelcho coming to get them on Elephant Island. Um, so that's great. And again, mad props to our photographer who, uh, who took these photos. Now here is what is terrifying and amazing here. So you look down, you can see Elephant Island um, where they you know, walked out a good long ways. And then that 800 miles and dead reckoning um, to try to get to South Georgia. As you can see, if they had missed South Georgia, which is by the way, not a really big place. Um, and so it would, would have been easy, easy to, to not hit it dead on. Um, there's that that's it there's nothing until africa right so if you had missed this in the storm in the waves and whatever just amazing amazing uh work to to navigate that and everything more than more penguins so um so elephant island the endurance uh expedition definitely something to to read up on and and yeah I, like i used to think i was mean to my characters and i got nothing on real life you know i agree with mike there so uh, more glaciers more icebergs so next week we're back on i mean we're still technically on our theme calendar it's just that we have a fifth tuesday so it's a little special uh, next next week we're back on our regularly scheduled the business of creativity um so it's a business career topic and we're going to talk about the fear of success 
which is one of those things that sounds incredibly counterintuitive, but I think is way more common than people actually talk about. So, um, so yay. Okay, good. <laughs> people like in good things. Yeah. Throw, throw in questions if you've got them. Um, so I am absolutely open to if you have comments, observations on the fear of success, or if you have questions or something you would like me to address specifically about that, feel free to send that my direction. Um, I've got a bunch of notes already, but, um, I want to make sure that it does what you want it to do. So, um, so let me know about that. And then, oh, what else do we have going on in October? Cause I've forgotten what the next that's right. Oh, how could I forget? I wanted to talk about the many uses of NaNoWriMo, um, what it is good for, what it is not good for, and how to use it to your best advantage. Um, and so since we're working our way toward November, um, we'll be doing that in October. And then after that, our Learn With Me in October is with Carla Hoke, who is um, a mis mixed martial artist and generally all around awesome. And we're going to talk about fight scenes and fighting people and fighting probably fighting zombies because it's october and you know we'll just we'll just fight all the things so um if you have specific questions that you want to bring to that um carla helps writers with fight scenes um so definitely take advantage of her so awesome so okay. that is it oh um natalie's pointing out have we talked about smorgasbord yet um not really i guess we could um smorgasbord is the uh I had photos up during the prep screen, but that doesn't mean anything. S'more Smorgasbord just came out. It's the cookbook for over a hundred new s'more recipes. It says 101 on the cover, but between you and me, we over deliver. Um, so Elena, who was here in the chat earlier, and um, our friend Julie and I put out a uh, book of s'more recipes I guarantee you have not thought of. And if you're thinking s'mores are so simple, you need a recipe for that. Like you need a recipe for boiling water. Guys, buckle up. Like there's good stuff in here. Actually, let me see if I have, let me see if I can grab a photo real fast. Oh, I can, okay. Um, yeah, cause, cause the magic of, the magic of uh, photo directories. Um, so the, yeah, this is a lot of fun anyway. I would love to, uh, love for you guys to try some of those and it's, Basically, our thinking was it's 2020 and we need carbs. Okay, so s'mores are something you can do outside. So you can um, make a, make a risk-mitigated uh, party and have a good time. So yeah, and poor Seeker in the chat had to, to he was one of our taste testers because we had to decide what recipes to include and it was a tough job, but he, he stepped up. So, okay, awesome. I'm glad it was, I'm glad it confirmed some research things for you, Mike. I appreciate that hearing that. That's good. Yeah, because um, definitely... Um, Viking sea travel, those people were insane. <laughs> they some, also some very skilled navigation going on there. Um, okay. And all right. Oh, Grace wants to know how to make s'mores without a campfire. Okay. So we have, Elena and I, you know, have made s'mores in our, in a house, um, over in over a devoting fire. I am morally opposed to the idea of s'mores in a microwave, like in, an, in the apocalypse, perhaps we'll discuss this, but that's not that's not how s'mores need to be done. However, we have done s'mores over candles inside and all sorts of things. You know, you're just, it's gonna take you a little bit longer than if you have a big wood fire, but it can be done. And I'm pretty insistent that a roasted, fire roasted s'more tastes different than a internally steamed microwave s'more. However, if you're up against the wall, Heat your, heat your marshmallow and whatever may is, is available to you. But, uh, but I will throw out that, you know, making a s'more over a candle absolutely is possible and it's, you know, it's perfectly plausible s'more. So, okay. Um, all right. Um, yeah, Elena's mentioning in the chat, she has roasted s'mores on a, uh, roasted marshmallows on a salad fork over a jar candle. Yes, this can be done. So, all right, and um, and we have vegan s'mores, and we have s'mores with fruit on them. Like there's all kinds of s'more options. All right, so um, where are we going? Okay, let me get back to because I'm gonna get incredibly distracted by all those pretty pictures. Okay, <laughs> so that's it. Thank you guys for being patient. I know there was 
wonky stuff going on with the stream. Um, again, we had a power outage shortly before and it sounds like our local ISP is having trouble. So um, I appreciate you guys sticking around. We'll try to be smooth flowing for next week. Um, so that is it. That's all I've got. So you guys take care and I will see you next Tuesday. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>